Welcome, everybody. Uh, Alex is going to start off the presentation. He's going to share his screen so everybody can uh, can see the slides he's put together for the analysis on the uh, the part analysis and how we on a, a part that suits the Flex CNC really well. Um, just the the process that we've gone through to help a customer justify and understand how it's going to work on our machine um, and uh, and ultimately calculate the uh, ROI. So. Alex, uh, I'll kick it off to you. If, if anybody has questions, just go ahead and chat them um, on the chat menu, and then we can. Uh, I'll, I'll we'll be sure to address them. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me uh, the time to talk to you guys. Uh, very good morning to everybody. I think this is like Nick said, and uh, he mentioned it previously. This is a great example for us. And especially this type of parts, this is the kind of customers that we believe it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for them and for us to, to build a partnership because um, it's obviously uh, we see an increase in production, an increase in uh, tolerance. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of features that we're, that we're going to talk about during this presentation. And I think it's, uh, it's important for all of us to, to be able to, to share that with our customers and uh, suppliers and distributors. So, <clears throat> I hope everybody can see my screen. Can you see my screen, Nick? Uh, first, first thing I want to talk about is uh, the customer bio and some of the uh, part properties. Uh, we uh, we got an inquiry from some of our uh, distributors about a uh, part piece or a work piece of two uh, boilerplates. Essentially, the company it's a uh, they, you can find more information in some of the um, websites and things like that, but essentially a complete boiler room solutions that uh, they're focused on maximizing uh, heat exchangers, energy, and things like that. So these are big plates and um, for heat exchangers and, and very thick in some instances. They go from uh, um, 3 sixteenths all the way to, to an inch um, in thickness. And different materials. In this specific case, we were talking about an um, ASTM A5116 uh, seal plate. This is, uh, we're looking at some of the standards and this, this is mostly for moderate and lower temperature service, uh, but it has very welding, uh, very good welding properties. So they, uh, they use it quite a lot in some of these uh, manufacturers. And as you can see, the, uh, the grade that we were looking at, because I, I believe for that standard, we have three or four grades, different grades. It's a 70, which is a minimum of, of tensile strain of 70 KSI. And then the elongation between 17 and 21. Um, the other grades are obviously lower. The uh, yielding point, it's for that elastic region, it's a little bit uh, larger than this one. Uh, this one, it's, it's the highest tensile strength from all the uh, different grades that they have. Uh, obviously, a uh, high carbon steel, um, depending on the manufacturer and, and some of the, uh, the grades, it fluctuates between uh, 0.28 to 0.31%. 30, and you can see in some of the tables, there's also some other components, uh, phosphorus, um, silicon, sulfur, things like that. And we have an example of the uh, current conditions or the, uh, the existing conditions for the customer. Why, why were they trying to come to us? And let me show you. As you can see, it's a very manual operation. Uh, they have three men working on. Uh, Alex, we I can't see your screen. Like we can just see you at the moment. Okay, hold on. I think that's better. There we go, there we go. Yeah, I was just taking the other one. So it's a very manual operation. We have 
in the process, three men involved. Two of them are working on the layout and one of them is working on the drilling of the workpiece. Um, as you can see here, the fixture of the uh, machine is actually very, uh, uh, very simple, but also it takes some time to, to align some of the plates. In some instances, they put uh, one or two plates at a time to maximize uh, and optimize the time that they're using for processing. But in the end, it's really a time consuming uh, setup because you obviously have uh, a lot of men involved. Uh, it's not highly um, accurate in some instances because they have a lot of scrap based on the layout on the guys. Uh, they're just essentially by hand drawing some position holes, things like that. So it, it's, it's something that the customer wanted to improve, especially on the fixturing side and the setup side and make these uh, more streamlined operations. With the current conditions, uh, especially with social distancing and things, things like that, it's, it's obviously imperative for a lot of customers to be able to um, to have operations where they only have one or two operators so they, they, they can keep uh, everybody uh, as safe as possible. So our main goal, not intended at the time, but was to minimize the amount of people that it was working with this uh, workpiece. Uh, so we went from three operators to reduce to one, which is going to be in charge of operating a machine, uh, loading the part and fixing the part. We, uh, we ran a demo for, for this setup and make sure that based on the volume of the part, uh, conditions of a regular shop with just a forklift or a crane, how much time would it take for a single person to do the whole operation and, and um, uh, on, a, on a real scenario? So we, we calculated uh, around five minutes, no more than eight minutes, between five and eight minutes, depending on how many plates you want to set up. Uh, so that's actually uh, we reduced quite a bit the, the time that we spend working on the, uh, on the fixturing and setting up the machine. Let me share with you. Hope you can see the uh, part description. So we have two different plates. Uh, one of the plates it had only 12 holes of inch and a half. The, the interesting part about these holes is that it had a chamfer in all of them with a non-standard angle of 31 degrees. You can see here, all of them had a 31 degree. And also the uh, big hole in the middle also had to be chamfer. We have seen other customers that they, they do this kind of operations, chamfering on the outside as well. So it's all in the inside and the outside. In this case, this particular plate did not have anything on the outside. So we didn't need to process any of that. Uh, but it was important for us to, to be accurate enough on the uh, holes and position and obviously on the angle. That was the first plate. The second plate, uh, it was a little bit more complicated because uh, it had a little bit uh, more holes. We're talking about 302 holes with a uh, diameter of two and a half inches. So it's uh, a little bit bigger than the, uh, the first one. So I think as far as uh, difficulty or complexity, the, the first blade is quite simple. Um, it's just a matter of what kind of tools are we going to use and in which order, things like that. And the second one is trying to maximize and uh, speed up the process as much as possible so we can get the, uh, the 300, uh, 302 holes as fast as we can. And I also have put a side view for the uh, workpiece because I wanted to uh, take a note on the uh, diameter, the outside diameter of this plate. So we're talking about 102 inches, which is a considerably large plate um, volume wise. I believe this uh, was probably around 300 kilos between 280, so roughly maybe 500 pounds, things that, some, something in that range. One of the first things that we do uh, is to evaluate uh, what are the customer needs uh, as far as time analysis uh, or uh, demonstration. And then, and in this case, we did both. We, we had a virtual uh, time analysis. Essentially, we used uh, some of the CAM software and some other tools, analytical tools, and things like uh, 
give us some some range of uh, times of operations on on all these um, processes. So we use our CAM software, come up with a setup sheet, um, analyze what kind of tools can we use, what are the best options, and um, and on all, also we we run some demos for some of our customers, which we which we can do at any point in time. It is, it's not a big problem. And um, so we came up to, with two options for plate number one, the plate with the 12 holes and one and a half inch. Um, I think the, uh, the biggest concern that we had was doing the chamfering. And um, the first operation that we thought about it was worth, it was just simple drilling first and then doing the, uh, um, the countersunk and three quarter end mill chamfer on the uh, inside of the plate is this one here so we had the first operation just doing the drill 12 holes and then doing the contour sunk here and doing the contour sunk here too so we had two different tools uh two different operations and that was a total time of 32 minutes and 25 seconds so we thought about how can we improve this and make it a little bit faster so we uh opted to find a tool where we have a combo tool um it's a one and a half uh, inch drill with the chamfer included. So we are using a tool that is going to do both operations at the same time. So we went from two operations, two tools, and uh, two, tool, two different tool chains to only one tool and one tool change. Uh, so for that reason, we save uh, roughly 14 minutes, which is almost half of the time that we were spending doing the tool changes and things like that. Um, so it's a considerable amount of savings, especially considering that uh, we have three persons involved in this operation. So if we can, if we can uh, make four parts in one hour rather than uh, making uh, just two, I mean, it's, it's definitely doubling our production. For the plate number two, it was a little bit more complicated. We, uh, we did not go with the route of doing two uh, uh, combo tools. We essentially, uh, follow a conventional pad where we have a two inch, two and a half inch drill, try to do all the uh, holes at once. <clears throat> and as you can see, it's a, the time uh, for this process is really uh, extremely high because obviously you have a, a, a hole that the uh, diameter is, is, is big, but also you have a, a significant amount of number of holes. So we, uh, we try to come around with different options of feet speeds and things like that so we can maximize and and our guys from uh, allied help us quite a bit to uh, to really um, tune it as as best as possible to be able to reduce the amount of time so we started over one hour and then we reduce all the way to 52 52 minutes um, this specific plate has other different uh, hole diameters on the outside so but that's not significant compared to the uh, to the two and a half inch drill. Uh, you, we can see it's two minutes for the uh, second operation, uh, almost six minutes for the, three, the third operation, and uh, the chamfering for the inside takes uh, roughly 16, 16 minutes. So total amount of time that we spend on this uh, part is, is typically one hour and 20 minutes plus fixturing and um, set up that is between five to ten minutes so we're talking about an hour and a half no more than no more than that i'm going to show you a uh, video of the uh demo give me one second This video, it's uh, 26 uh, minute long and we will share with you all the, uh, the links to it. And also I will advise everybody to subscribe to our channel. We have very good information about um, a lot of the new demos that we're working every day, some of the new fixturing and, and especially some of the recommendations from our guys from Allied. And uh, I think it's a very good resource for information. So in this video, it's 26 minute long, but I'm not gonna play all of it. I'm just going to play a few seconds of each, uh, of each section that I think it will be uh, of our interest. Um, at the time mark of two, uh, two minutes and 45 seconds, you can clearly see the machine uh, operating. And if you 
if you go all the way to a minute 23 and 11 seconds, you will start looking at um, the whole finish. So I'm going to play it now. This is one plate only, uh, but uh, we try to set up with uh, two, two plates at the same time. So it is possible. And um, we ran it with two different uh, uh, two, uh, two holders, a Cat 40 and a Cat 50. And the difference was that we were able to uh, speed it up a little bit with the Cat 50, obviously with the, uh, the robustness of uh, having the high output package that uh, we'll talk about it in, in a little bit, uh, where we have the CFQ box. And uh, now obviously we can uh, achieve higher torques for, uh, for these machining operations. So that's the machine running. I'm gonna go to minute 23. That's when we finish. You, you can still see some of the, uh, the surface finish. It's actually quite good. Uh, we were very satisfied with the end product. You will see it now, but we're pushing some of the uh, leftover parts, so. We're extremely satisfied with the final product and minute 23 and 30 seconds, you can find uh, some of the explanations of um, what tool we were using, why the type of insert. So if, if you guys are interested in um, learning more about it, I mean, absolutely, we'll be happy if you, if you can just join uh, the, uh, the link on YouTube and the channel and start looking at some of the information there. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation. One of the, the things that uh, we try to help our customers, uh, especially the, the people that is in charge of making the decision of purchasing one of these equipment is, and if we look at, at, uh, at this issue from a uh, earn, man, earn value management perspective or risk management or some sort of a framework for project management, especially on the uh, uh, value creation field, we'll see that um, we obviously want to emphasize um, the value that we're creating by acquiring one of our machines. Uh, not only from the technical value, the operational, the economical, financial, and the strategic value. It's very important to understand that in this specific case, we, we saw the opportunity for all of them, like all the communication steps that are required to, um, to really have a very good ROI and, and minimize the economic risk of doing an investment of this, this type of things. Uh, on the technical value, for example, we, we, we can achieve better tolerances, uh, we can reduce scrap rates, we can, uh, we can obviously improve the, uh, the time of processing. So it's, uh, it's significant the, the value that we're creating in that area. But if we look at all the other areas, we can see that from the operational value, uh, producing from three operators to one operator is considerably effective in the sense that we can use those two uh, extra men to process other parts, to uh, um, help with the setup. So we're essentially gaining uh, a lot of uh, uh, lost time there. And on the economical value, for example, we can, we can easily uh, make an argument about uh, our increase in production is going to increase our revenue, is going to increase our opportunities. So the economical value is definitely there by uh, by resistance scrap, obviously, where uh, our operation is uh, more effective. So, but in the strategic sense, it's also extremely important to understand that uh, as a company, uh, making an investment in this type is obviously in our best interest because we're going to have more opportunities. If our processes are reduced, we obviously have more time to work on other parts. And uh, maybe if we have a spike in uh, production, then we're going to be able to, to handle it a lot easier than uh, with the current setup. Uh, for that sense, we, we felt that this part and these work pieces were ideal 
for uh, FlexCNC uh, because we can meet all these uh, value creation opportunities and capabilities very easily. When we look at uh, an enterprise, especially on the cash flow, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to make an argument of uh, why do we need to make an investment? And the way I see it, and I really like this graph, as you can see, we have a baseline, which is today. And that baseline is obviously, is gonna change depending on some of the decisions that a, a company will make. But most of the decisions should be either increasing value or maintaining value, which means that if you don't make this investment, how is that gonna affect your company? How can we help you maintain that value, which is protecting the revenue? It's so essentially it will be, okay, well, we can uh, avoid unbudgeted expenses. Let's say if somebody, uh, some of the operators is sick, cannot work, and then we're obviously gonna have to hire more people. What if like we have a lot of scrap or what if they, uh, uh, you know, some things like that. But we're, at the same time, we're also working on reducing expenses, like increasing the amount of orders that we can handle and gaining new customers. Because this machine is, is going to give you the flexibility of not just working in this specific part, but we can use the setup, for example, the pendulum mode to work on two pieces at a time. It could be two different pieces if we want it. So it increases the ability to make new parts, better parts, and expand your, your markets. Uh, we like to provide the customers with a um, quantification of this risk, risk and also we look at the current operations of their facilities. Uh, how much time do they have? Like how many shifts uh, do they take? How many breaks on those breaks? What is their estimated or average quality and maintenance uh, downtime and uh, their overall efficiency? And we use all of those parameters to come up with an available processing time, which is we use uh, for our calculations and, our, and then of ROI. Because we don't know we don't know exactly how the operation works, but we, we talk to them. We get a very good sense of how can we uh, estimate some of these numbers and uh, achieve a more or less an average of, uh, of that. So in this case, we were talking about an efficiency of 75%. So we have seen some companies that uh, they, they fluctuate between 75 to um, 87, 88%. But in this case, we had uh, 75%. So that meant that uh, for uh, the plate number one, which is at 12 holes and an uh, inch and a half, uh, with the uh, operation, the two operations procedure that we were suggesting, we were gonna be able to produce uh, 30 parts on three shifts. But if we look at the, uh, the second process uh, that we suggested with a combo tool, we were able to produce 52 parts, which is a considerable increase of uh, parts uh, process per day. And we did the same for the, uh, the plate number two, which, which is the 300, uh, 302 holes and two, two inch and a half drill. And came up with a, an approximate amount of plates per year of 4,461. And for the plate number one, using the option two, which is a 52 parts per, per day of 19,000 um, and 18 parts which is almost double from uh, what they, uh, uh, what we thought it could be possible with only uh, uh, two operations with 10,000. So it's a considerable amount of uh, increase in, in production. The next step, it's uh, something that we uh, try to come up and provide to the customer as far as, okay, uh, how can we help you make a good RI decision? And we always give, uh, provide this example of this uh, scenario, which is we calculated how many people are they using for, uh, in this specific example, it was to laying out the part, making those uh, um, selections for the holes and, and where, where they can locate the holes. And the other one, how many men are you using for the actual operation, the drilling, the punching and things like that. In this case, um, this specific company had two men working on the uh, laying out part. And they also have three men working on drilling, trying to expedite as much as possible that process. And so obviously those men might have a different uh, base labor rate. 
depending on the skills, uh, the experience and things like that. So we use all that information uh, also with information that we already got about their efficiency, the amount of shift that they use, uh, how many uh, um, how many operators are, are working in this specific process, and we come up with a, a very simple RI calculation, which essentially we try to calculate the cost per month of this specific part. And for that, we use the amount of men multiplied by the labor rate, which could be $17, $13, or whatever is the case, $25, depending if it's a, it's a union shop or it's not a union shop, things like that. And then we give a 1.3 rate for other expenses. Um, it could be, uh, you know, the, uh, all the health insurance, things like that. But so in some instances, we have seen some other companies that it might go all, all the way to 1.5, 1.6, depending on the uh, operational expenses of each individual company. Um, we try to be conservative. That's why we use a 1.3. Um, and then we multiply that by the working time, which essentially we already calculated uh, before, and the amount of weeks that they're working per year. And they, we divide everything by, by 12, and we get a cost per month. So if you can see in this example for the manual operations, we use all that information calculated, and we have a cost per month for, let's say, for the layout guys of 7,600. And... For the drilling um, uh, people, we had almost 8,800. So the combined co total cost per month for this specific parts of $16,449. That's for the manual operations. So what we like to do is to compare that to the cost of acquiring one of our machines. In this specific case, we recommended to use a uh, 20, 20 by eight G series with a high output package because we believe that with that bed size, it will give them the flexibility that they need to work on all these plates, but also work on different parts and also have the ability to use a pendulum mode so they can be working with two different work, working areas at the same time. And, and obviously we will we'll include the cost of having one operator instead of the, uh, the five that you will have in a manual operation with a normal base labor rate. It's just exactly the same. So we calculate a cost per month for that operator and also the cost per month of uh, owning this machine or acquiring this machine. This, in this case, for this uh, bed size, the cost is, uh, the prices for this cost without the higher output package is $385,000 uh, plus a higher output package which, which includes a CAT 50 spindle and the CF gearbox. It's obviously a package that we, we, we really think is, is key for this specific application because it maximizes the, the power of the machine and reduces the amount of time of operation. And, and, but it's not necessarily required to have many tools for this specific applications. So we didn't have to add an extra tool changer for, for this case where we're adding another 10 tools. So I think with 10 tools, it's, it's more than enough, especially if they're working only on these two, these two parts. So that's a total cost of $425,000. And um, so if we calculate a, an investment of 60 months, uh, the cost per month for, uh, for that total cost is roughly $7,100. So if we add that to the cost of having one operator, so they give us the cost per month of the flex CNC of around 10,000, almost $11,000 compared to the 16,000 uh, 16, that having just a manual operations. So you, you, you can see immediately the amount of savings that you can create only per month by just having one uh, flex CNC, which is critical these days because uh, especially with social distancing and, and some of these things that we, uh, we obviously have to take into account these days, um, going from five operators that are interacting uh, right next to each other uh, to uh, one single operator, it's, it's a huge advantage on the operational side. And so we use the total savings per year, which is essentially just multiplying the, uh, the savings per month by 12. 
And for, for the calculation of the ROI, how many months would it take uh, to pay for this, this investment? We essentially take the uh, total cost, which is the $425,000, divided by the uh, 66,000, that is the savings per year, and that'll give us uh, the amount of months that we, um, that we need for, for, to pay off for this investment. So it's roughly 77 months. Now, we're being very conservative here because we're using a 1.3 factor that it could be 1.5, it could be 1.6, depending on the location of the company, depending on your operational ability. So it, it's something that we believe could, could be a little bit bigger. So, make, so the savings could be a lot uh, larger for, for this case. But uh, taking just a conservative approach, uh, that's that's our understanding of the ROI and the amount of time that it will take uh, for the customer to pay back this um, this investment. And uh, I think for for us, that's really what I, we wanted to talk about. Um, we obviously decided to go with the G series uh, 2008 because it will fit it will fit the bed and the workpiece uh, very well. It will allow us to have some flexibility with the pendulum pendulum mode. We don't need more than 10 tools because as you can see, the uh, operations are quite simple. There's a lot of drilling, uh, but we definitely require the CAT 50 and the higher output package to be able to maximize the, uh, the, uh, the capabilities of the machine. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, leave the room for some questions. And uh, if, if there's any questions, just please go ahead, send it on your Q&A. Uh, you can also send us an email and or call us we're, we're willing to to talk about this example a little bit more if you if you have any questions hey alex looks like one, one of the questions that i see here is uh how wide the machines can be built and uh just to address that quickly um basically the, the machines standard are built four foot wide or six foot wide um and we've gone as wide as 12 foot on the y-axis so it's, it's ho hopefully that helps uh Address that, um, and then uh, on the horsepower, that's another good point. Uh, so for the examples that we're showing you where we're drilling a two and a half inch hole, I mean, we're, we're using that, you can see here in the description where we have the ZF gearbox, Cat 50 spindle, and that's where we're putting uh, 100 horsepower to the spindle. So and that, that's what's allowing you to push the correct speeds and feeds for a, a, a two and a half inch drill. And we're also, we're using good tooling. So I mean, we're using the allied uh, drills um, that's what you guys saw in the video earlier, and uh, and that's how we're able to achieve that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Especially having that horse uh, horsepower um, at that, that range of speed is definitely a huge gain for uh, for the machine because it, it definitely gives you the ability to to perform the operation uh, without without any problems. Uh, other than that, the the I, I really love it, it, great job, Alex. Uh, I love showing the comparison between. Uh, how the customer was doing it to how they're doing it now. Um, it's, you know, that, that huge jump in technology and, and the way shops are processing parts still are very much so uh, very manual. And, uh, you know, jumping into the technology using our machines and, and others, you know, we can really make some uh, huge impacts on the economy and, and help speed processes up. So it's, uh, I like showing that. Absolutely, especially with this type of uh, bed sizes, you will, you will encounter that our competitors are, their pricing is obviously out of completely out of range for a lot of these uh, customers because I mean we're talking about eight feet, ten feet, twelve feet uh, wide. So it's just something that you don't see very often, and our competitors are definitely uh, <laughs> increasing their uh, price point considerably. Other than that, uh, let's see. So another question here. Um, Somebody's asking if the machines are mostly just for flat plate. Um, but can they be used for tubing or structural? And you now the example we showed you is, is specifically just for, uh, obviously just for flat plate. Uh, but that same machine at tubing, uh, pipe, those are excellent applications for the machine as well. The, uh, today we were just showing a, a, you know, a, a big plate example. But, but absolutely. Um, we've got some, uh, we can do another webinar on running large tube on our fourth axis. Uh, just to show how we're able to accomplish that with the big bed on these machines. Uh, but they're, they're excellent for machining on I-beam, channel, angle iron, flat bar, uh, anything else. 
Yeah, the, the larger the better for us. And uh, you have mentioned in your previous webinar the uh, some of the uh, work pieces that we use and the outer diameter of 16 inches and, and things like that. So, I mean, we have a lot of resources in our uh, FlexNC uh, YouTube channel. So if everybody is interested in uh, looking at some different parts, please just go over there because it's a very good resource for all this information. And uh, other than that, Alex, uh, yeah, I think I will. I'll post. I will post all the other answers in, a, in an email um, to some of the other questions here. Um, we'll share the justification online. I'll share the the YouTube videos we showed today. I'll, I'll make those public on YouTube, um, and uh, and then we'll, uh, we can send out an email to everybody. So thanks for coming. Um, thank you, Alex. And uh, other than that, we'll we'll sign off for now. And until next time. Thank you very much, guys, and uh, please go to the website. Thank you.